Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. If you have watched uh, the video that we presented on the Sunday afternoon, if you didn't watch that video, uh, I highly recommend that you go to this site, to Dwight Opines, all one word, dot blogspot, dot com, and uh, watch the video there. It will give you a basis for the questions and answers that we want to consider this evening or this afternoon. And uh, we are going to have a few questions and a few responses to that presentation. The presentation was a uh, virtual debate with Alan Bailey. And I want to quickly mention the advantages of a virtual debate. When you have a virtual debate, it can be watched in video form on the internet. It also keeps people from having to travel by airplane and uh, automobile to get way across the current country to see the debate. It can be viewed in a few minutes on the internet. Uh, this virtual debate is only 43 minutes long, so that's about all the time that you'll have to spend in uh, considering the debate, the, the virtual debate that I had with Alan Bailey. Uh, I divided his video into several segments and uh, he was very plain. He talked first of all uh, about Matthew 5. He also talked about Matthew 19. He didn't really consider 1 Corinthians 7. And from watching his presentation I may be wrong, but I got the impression that what he considers to be the main grounds for divorce are found in Matthew 19 and 9 and Matthew 5 and 32. That is, he emphasized the ground for fornication. He believes that uh, fornication either committed by the woman or by the man is sufficient grounds for divorce. However, he does question people's uh, answers to whether or not they have good grounds or legitimate grounds. And so he hesitates to perform a wedding ceremony based on those grounds. But he does not hesitate to uh, preach divorce for fornication for the man or the woman. And I would like to say that he implies that the woman has uh, the same grounds for divorce that the man has which I disagree with. I don't believe that the Jewish woman had the right to initiate a divorce. There is a historical concept that is often given by those who believe in divorce for fornication. They talk about the guilty and innocent parties. Uh, if the man is guilty of fornication, the woman can put away her husband. If the woman is guilty of fornication, the man can put away his wife. And it's based upon the concept of the guilty and the innocent party. But that's not a first century historical concept. I've been told and I've looked at it uh, a little bit, that Erasmus in the 15th century 
is really the one who emphasized the innocent and the guilty party. And so it is far removed from the first century where we have the idea that a Jewish woman, according to the concept of Agna, could not initiate a divorce and put away her husband even if he committed fornication. But the man could put away his wife for fornication. And so with those preliminary remarks, I'm going to ask the, the, those who have a, may have a question to come to the podium and ask their questions. My question is in Matthew 19, verse 3, the question is asked, is it lawful? And I consider this to be the same as if I ask, is it raining? So if we take this as English would do, we would call this present tense. Is it lawful? Is it raining? So it would have to mean that this is asking in the present tense. In verse 9 he says, except it be for fornication, which is telling me in the present tense, still. And then if we do accept this fornication to be as Mr. Bailey did, to be for us today, then when you go down to Matthew 19 verse 16, it was asked of Jesus the question of what one must do to have eternal life. And Jesus replies in verse 17 of this same chapter to keep the commandments. And in verse 18 and 19, if we thought the commandments were could be the New Testament, we could go to 18 and 19 and he states the 12 commandments of the Old Testament law. So my question is, is if we are supposed to accept this fornication law to be able to marry and divorce, do we also accept the thought that to inherit eternal life that we obey the 12 commandments of the Old Testament law? That's my question. I appreciate your comment and question. And I believe that what you have presented in your comment is very appropriate because Jesus functioned and he was constrained by the Old Testament. He functioned under the Old Testament and he was constrained by the Old Testament. So when he was asked by the rich young ruler, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him what was currently appropriate for him to do, and that was to keep the old law. And I believe that uh, Alan has made a mistake when he decided to divide the answer uh, into three parts, one for each dispensation of time. He had a, an answer for the patriarchal age, which was no divorce. And then there was an answer for the mosaical age. They were given the right to divorce their wife, he believes, for any cause, any cause whatsoever under the Old Testament for the, because of the hardness of their hearts. And Jesus merely acknowledged that Moses gave them the right under the Old Testament law to divorce their wife 
for the hardness of their hearts. But then Alan considers the last answer that Jesus gave, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. Well, <clears throat> he uh, sees that as New Testament law given to Christians. Uh, I believe all of us here see that as uh, Old Testament response. Uh, fornication corresponds with Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4. He, uh, he divided uh, Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4 into two exceptions. And uh, I want to say a few things about that. First of all, I believe that his response ignores case law. The concept of case law, the structure of case law. And uh, I think he should study case law a little more than he has, or at least present it uh, a little differently. Uh, in data processing, I uh, studied a concept that very much corresponds with uh, case law. And uh, this construct uh, stuck, struck is an if then construct. If you have a condition A and a condition B and a condition C, then you have a consequence given for those conditions. You may have more than one. You have, may have multiple consequences, but you may have consequence A. Now in Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4, we turn to that. Uh, you have several conditions presented, and then you have a consequence also presented. So when a man takes a wife and marries her is a condition. The word Mary implies masters her. And it happens, we can see that's a descriptive condition of what may happen, that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. And another condition, he writes her a certificate of divorce puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. When she is departed from his house, and my new King, King James Version says, and goes and becomes another man's wife. The King James Version says, she may go and become another man's wife. And so the King James Version, by using may, implies she has the permission to go and become another man's wife. It also uh, implies that not only she has the permission to go and become another man's wife, that this is a consequence and not just a description of a condition. In other words, certain conditions have been given and the consequence is she may go 
and become another man's wife. But the translations, many of the translations I have read does not use the word may. And when may was used in the old English language, it not, did not necessarily mean permission. It meant something she just might do. And so I believe that it's descriptive. And instead of may, we should interpret this and she goes. If that's spelled correctly. And to prove that, I want to turn over to Jeremiah, the third chapter. And look at uh, the first few verses in that chapter. They say, in verse 1, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him. That's uh, the English interpretation of the very same Hebrew word or she may go, or and she goes. The very same Hebrew word. And even the King James Version says, and she goes from him and becomes another man's. May he return to her again. Would not the land be greatly polluted? So we can see from this uh, reading from the New King's, King James Version and even the King James Version that this permissive consequence is turned into a descriptive condition. It's just something that may happen. It's likely to happen. And uh, Jesus mentioned that when He explained to the Pharisees that if a man would put away his wife except for fornication, he was actually causing her to commit adultery because even if she were innocent, say she just burned the bread, if she were just innocent and he uh, just didn't like the fact that she burned the bread and he put her away for that, what is he doing? He's causing He's causing her to commit adultery. He's not innocent in the fact that she goes out and she finds another man and she commits adultery. He has instigated her adultery. But the Jews thought that since a Jewish man could put away his wife for any reason, then it really didn't matter what happened to her. He wasn't responsible for her. If she went out and married another person and committed adultery, then I suppose that might have been fine with him. That's a very hard-hearted position in my estimation to take to cause your innocent wife who is guilty of nothing more than burning the bread or as the, one of the wives of Josephus was just uh, displeasing to Josephus and he put her away. That uh, caused her to go out, probably, I don't know about what happened to his wife, but it caused her to go out and commit adultery. And so this is just part of case law. You're describing some conditions and also de describing 
some consequences. So when we read Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4, we see some conditions being described. Man takes a wife, he marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he found some uncleanness, which is from the Hebrew word erva, which means a matter of nakedness. And if we go through uh, Leviticus 18 and 20 and look at the kinds of nakedness that were involved in fornication, same word, uh, a matter of nakedness, he finds a matter of nakedness in her. And that is, and that was, according to the school of Shimei, unchastity. As we've already seen in the video, there were three schools of thought. There was the school of Shimei, who considered divorce for unchastity or fornication. There was a school of Hillel, who considered the divorce for any reason, even if a woman just burned the bread, or we considered also Akaba, who said a man could divorce his wife even if he found someone prettier than his current wife. They all interpreted Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4 as unconditional except for the school of Shimei who found the condition of unchastity to be important. That was the original reason the man put away his wife. Now there's a secondary reason that Alan Beatty wants to bring out, which the original husband has no control over at all. It says in verse 3, if the latter husband detests her and writes a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends, sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former, and that word then is important because it indicates the consequence of those conditions, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. Well, I guess we can speculate why she was defiled. I personally think that she was defiled by her second marriage to a man uh, who she had no right to marry. I know that there's disagreements about this. Uh, some believe that the woman does have a right to get remarried if she's been put away for fornication. Uh, for example, Malcolm believes that. Um, there's others uh, who uh, in Matthew 19 and 9 believe the woman does not have the right, if she's guilty of adultery, to remarry. Ronnie Wade is uh, one such person. Uh, if, she, if she marries again and she's uh, guilty of fornication, she's the guilty party and she has no right to marry again. And then there was Irvin Waters who believed that uh, she has the implied right to marry again. She has been put away for fornication. That has been a legal and lawful divorce. And as a result, uh, she must, if she so desires, marry again legally. And uh, he believes that she has that legal right. So we see uh, three positions. The implied legal right for the woman who's guilty of adultery to remarry. We also see 
The denial of a right to remarry by Ronnie Wade says the guilty party has no right to marry again. And we uh, see also that the woman does not have the legal right to marry again. It, you know, uh, I, I personally believe that she does not have the legal right to marry again. Uh, why would we give a woman who is guilty of adultery a right that not even one who's innocent she simply burned the bread and uh, she got put away and she has no right to go and marry another person because Jesus said if she does she's committing adultery and her husband is causing her to commit adultery and so she's totally innocent She's committing adultery. Her husband is causing her to commit adultery. But here is this woman who has committed adultery and she has the legal right to go and get remarried. Uh, that seems totally unfair to me. Uh, Brother Malcolm, when I brought this issue up with him, said, are you uh, trying to tell me that a person who may go and be another man's wife does not have that right? Well, I believe that we've described the fact that this is a condition and she goes, which merely describes a condition and is not a permission. That is, she may go and become another man's wife. There's a big difference between a descriptive condition and a permissive consequence. And so uh, simply because Jeremiah 3 and 8 is describing the fact that she may go and become another man's wife. And Deuteronomy 24 and 1 says even in the New King James Version when she's departed from his house and goes that's a, a descriptive con condition and not a permission. And so that's why I believe that uh, a woman who was put away in Deuteronomy 24 and 1 through 4, or as Jesus in correctly interpreted that passage, a woman who is put away for fornication does not have the right to go and become another man's wife. It's just something she's likely, given what uh, life really is, we know that life is subject to a lot of confusing and confounding, and you've got a young woman, she, she still wants companionship, she still wants to be married, she wants to have a sexual relationship with a man. It seems very unfair to many people to deny the opportunity for her to do that. But I think scripturally, uh, she doesn't have the right. I'd like to notice, uh, as an aside, Deuteronomy 22. Because George Batty also, in my estimation, who has debated Brother Malcolm, uh, he, uh, he just ignores this concept of conditions and consequences. Uh, Brother Batty has taken the position that a woman who's guilty of fornication must be executed each and every time. But if you uh, read the conditional language in Deuteronomy 22, you'll find that not every condition has to be satisfied. Uh, and if all the conditions are not satisfied, then the consequences do not pertain. For example, it says in verse 13, 
Deuteronomy 22, if any man takes a wife and goes into her and detests her and charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her, these are conditions, and says, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found that she was not a virgin then the father and mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city of the gate. And the young woman's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man, his wife, and he detests her. Now he has charged her with shameful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin. And yet there are evidence. These are the evidences of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And then the elders of the city shall take the man and punish him. Well, we see case law here. We see conditions that need to be satisfied before the consequences can pertain. For example, first of all, he detests her. That's a condition. If he does not detest her, what happens? Nothing. She's not detested. He charges her with shameful conduct. If he does not charge her with shameful conduct what happens nothing he's not charged her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says i took this woman and when i came to her i found she was not a virgin does he have to make this testimony to the elders does he have to take this kind of evidence to the elders and say I found it she was not a virgin well it's only after these conditions come about that the father has to defend his daughter but if these conditions do not come about then the, do uh, the father does not have to defend his daughter because he hasn't made it an issue. And that's the whole point. Are we going to make it, is the husband going to make it an issue? Or is he not going to make it an issue? Uh, Brother George Batty uh, had a very strange argument about the case of Joseph and Mary, he put forth what has been called the humility theory and said that Joseph was afraid of Mary because she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And he was so afraid of Mary, the kind of woman she was, the great exaltation that she experienced by having a child from the Holy Ghost, that he wanted to divorce her. And so we have the reason of divorce given that a woman who is uh, with child from the Holy Ghost is uh, to be feared and uh, we can put her away for that. George Bat Batty believes that uh, the woman could be put away for practically any reason. And so he just adds the fact that she was found with child of the Holy Ghost as one of those reasons a woman could put a, be put away. But I think Joseph was inspired enough and a righteous enough man and a good enough man to realize he had three options based upon the Old Testament. And uh, so the three options are simply one, He can make her a public example.
That is, he can do exactly what this man did to his wife. He detested her. He brought an evil name upon her. He accused her of shameful conduct. He took her before the elders. And there was a test made to see if she was really a virgin. And if she passed the test, there were no consequences. If she failed the test, there were severe consequences. And Joseph considered this idea of making her a public example. Now some have said, well, the Jews didn't have a right to do that. In that time, I believe the fact that uh, a woman who was caught in adultery and was brought to Jesus uh, assumes and proves to us that they would take such a course as this. Uh, but Joseph, being a good man, being a righteous man, was not willing to make her a public example. And so he decided, number two, to take another option, a private divorce. Private divorce. Well, some say, well, you know, divorce is not private. In relation to making someone a public example, divorce is very private. And uh, some say, well, there were two kinds of divorce. There was the public divorce and the private divorce, and he decided to take the private divorce option. Well, certainly all of that is up to debate. I believe he could have exercised his right under Deuteronomy 24 and 1 since he found what he considered to be some uncleanness, some matter of nakedness in Mary. He could have considered the private divorce option. The third option that he had, which is the option he finally took, he didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to put her away. He, uh, he could do exactly what Joseph did. He decided to go to his wife, uh, and she was his wife. And I would like to emphasize the point that when you're betrothed, to a Jewish woman, you're married to her, and uh, to get out of that situation with a woman, uh, the betrothal, you have to divorce her. And so he decided, because the Holy Ghost came to him and informed him not to be afraid to take Mary, his wife, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I think uh, George Batty is completely off the mark. In fact, I think his argument that he was wanting to put away his wife because he was afraid of her, the humility theory, is just totally absurd. And it's uh, so far out that it's not worthy of consideration. And I'm very disappointed that his fellow preachers have not really called him out on this and said, George, are you sure you should be preaching that? And he's preaching it to young people, trying to convince them that Joseph put away Mary because he was afraid of her. That's no reason to get a divorce. You get a divorce because... A woman is guilty of something, not because she is innocent and she has a, the Son of God in her womb because the Holy Spirit has impregnated her with the Son of God. Well, I've probably gone a lot longer than I wanted to, so let's have uh, another question.
along these lines? Well, you've answered two or three of the questions that I had, but there is, uh, there is another that I do have, we have in this age, and you mentioned that there was a guilty and a non-guilty party, in other words, one who would commit fornication and then that would be the guilty, consider, and then the other who did not would not be considered guilty. But I ask in this age, as we are farmers, as we are planters, we are not judging, we only receive the mercy which we would give. Would we be unguilty or without guilt if we would not forgive such an act? And would that not be held against us at judgment? Would you like to on that? I uh, thank you for that comment and that question. And that is a very serious question that we must consider. I was asked one time, well, what if we condemn those who God does not condemn? And of course, that is kind of circular because you could ask the question back, well, what if we pronounce innocent that which God does condemn? And it gets into the idea of can we judge? Can we judge, uh, make a personal judgment? And uh, some preachers have stated that the most popular verse in the Bible was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but should have everlasting life. That was the most popular verse in the Bible. But that has since been replaced with judge not lest you be judged. And so many people have said we should not judge. I believe we have the right to give our biblical opinion and that if we're giving uh, the correct biblical opinion then we're not making a judgment uh, we're just giving what the bible says for example first corinthians the fifth chapter there was a man who was uh, having a sexual relationship with his father's wife and he was stoutly condemned by the Apostle Paul. And uh, he told the church there that they were making a mistake not to pronounce judgment on that man. And he told them, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In other words, if we embrace such behavior as that, we are just as guilty as those who are actually practicing uh, such a, an act as that. So, <clears throat> do we have the responsibility to judge? I believe that we do, but not those without. We come in contact every day with uh, people who are uh, guilty of fornication, and adultery and all kinds of sexual lasciviousness in the world we according to 1st Corinthians 5 don't have the right to judge such people but uh, we have the right and even the responsibility to judge people in the church who are engaging in such behavior. Paul said if he was going to judge people in the world for this kind of behavior, he'd have to go out of the world. You, you'd be faced with it every single day. But, he said, he had already judged concerning this particular man and he expected them to judge the same thing and so he said 
that uh, they were guilty of being too lenient with this man. As a consequence, he became, they became too hard with the man. They judged him. And uh, they wouldn't give him any relief from that judgment. And so Paul wrote to them again and said, you've judged the man too harshly. He's basically repented. You ought to give him some release from that judgment. So I believe we have to make a distinction uh, between people in the church and uh, people in the world. And I know that uh, my position on this marriage question is, is going to cause me to stand before God and give an account. Uh, some people will say that I've judged too harshly and perhaps uh, I'm in essence uh, guilty of the same thing. Jesus taught, you know, that uh, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And I don't believe that was the Gospel versus the Old Testament. I believe what Jesus said was exactly corresponding with the Tenth Command where it said that a man was not to covet, among other things, his neighbor's wife. And so, under the Old Testament, a man had a responsibility not to covet his neighbor's wife. In the New Testament, a man has the same responsibility not to covet his neighbor's wife. And I believe that many of the uh, statements that Jesus made in the Sermon on the Mount apply equally to Jews and Christians. Sometimes we say, well, that's Christian law. And I say, what about the Jewish law? Did it apply to them too? It did apply to them. Jesus said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He was talking to Jews who lived under the law and they were listening to the Pharisees who had emphasized their oral traditions as we can see from Matthew the 15th chapter where they asked Jesus why his disciples transgressed the tradition of the elders, the oral traditions, which evolved into the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Talmud. Why do your disciples go against the tradition of the elders? And Jesus said, why do you transgress the commandments of God with your traditions? Jesus always upheld the commandments of God. He did not always upheld, uphold the uh, traditions of the elders, the oral traditions. And I'd like to say that the uh, Judaism that is practiced today is based mainly upon the oral traditions that can be found in the Mishnah. And Jews emphasize their oral traditions found in the Mishnah more than they emphasize the Torah. And in fact, there are statements in the Mishnah to the effect that the Mishnah takes precedence, the oral traditions take precedence over the Old Testament or the Torah which is the first five books of the Bible. Yes, we can be unmerciful. Yes, we can be hypocritical. And I want to end my answer to this question with the idea of hypocritical judgment. The uh, Jews judged the Pharisees, often judged hypocritically because they were guilty of the same thing 
that they were accusing others of doing. Romans, the first chapter, points this out very much. You that judge another, are you doing the same things? If we're guilty of hypocritical judgment, then we have a problem. We have no right. Jesus said, first cast the beam out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to cast the moat out of your brother's eye. Hypocritical judgment. And uh, we all should consider ourselves whether or not we're engaging in that kind of a judgment, whether we're being a hypocrite, whether we don't have the right to go and condemn our brother because we're guilty of the same things. In the New Testament, we are told that uh, a person who is basically an innocent person, a godly person, may go to his brother and uh, he may point out his sins to him and try to regain his brother. I believe the fact that uh, judge not lest he be judged has been overused. Are, are there any other questions? Appreciate the questions that have been asked. Hope the response has not been too, uh, too long or I hope the response has been uh, satisfactory. And uh, we'll leave it at that. And thank you for being a part of this question and answer session. I'm trying to uh, give a question and answer session along with the presentation I made on the virtual debate with Alan Bailey. And uh, I think that question and answer session uh, allows some input from Christians and gives the Christians a voice in this. If there are no other questions, uh, we'll discontinue this question and answer session. Thank you.